Good evening, everyone. I hope everyone can hear me. You can. <laughs> Great. Thank you for that. Welcome, everyone, to our March Neighborhood Health Series event on dementia. We have over 124 guests registered and some still joining, but I think we'll get started. Wow. Thank you so much for being here tonight with us. And thank you very much to Clark County Credit Union for being our sponsor. And we'll hear from them in a moment. I'm really excited to see a lot of community members, students, prospective students, some of our Roseman faculty, physicians, and many familiar faces on the phone with us tonight. It's really important for us in developing this series that we bring our community together to talk about really important healthcare topics. This is our sixth year. Um, this topic is very close to my heart. My mother has vascular dementia, and so I'd like to dedicate tonight's webinar to my mother, Barbara Lambden. Thought it was really important as we started to think about how to structure this webinar tonight to bring together both the medical and the legal aspects. This is really, really important for those of us that are children of those people that have been diagnosed with dementia, caregivers, as well as spouses. So with that, I'd like to um, introduce my very um, esteemed guests with me tonight. I'm extremely proud to be joined tonight by two very gracious hosts, as well as Craig Fraley, our sponsor. Dr. Eric Farben is a neurologist at Roseman Medical Group, the medical practice of Roseman University's College of Medicine. He graduated from Tufts University with a BS and MS before attending medical school at the New Jersey Medical School, now Rutgers University Medical School with honors in 1999. Dr. Farben then completed his residency and fellowship in movement disorders. Having more than 20 years of experience, Dr. Farben specializes in Parkinson's, Huntington's, dystonia, ataxias, and tremors, and is currently conducting research in these areas. Roseman University is a site for both the Parkinson Study Group and the Huntington Study Group. Currently, there are studies for patients with many different degrees of the disease from newly diagnosed to advanced. Roseman is also waiting to start a study for multiple system atrophy, an atypical Parkinson's plus syndrome disorder with no current treatments, as well as an essential tremor study. Dr. Ferman also performs more aggressive treatments, including use of the deep brain stimulator, DBS, for patients for a variety of medical conditions. In his free time, Dr. Ferman enjoys baseball and the thrill of the chase from collecting patches from the Boy Scouts Jamborees. He collects patches from all around the world and also serves as a volunteer emergency medic at the annual Boy Scouts of America National Jamboree. Mike Kling founded Kling Law Offices in 2001 as nearly 20 years of experience providing financial, estate planning, asset protection, and business planning services. Mike offers full service legal assistance and advice in the fields of estate planning, wills, trusts, probate, trust administration, asset protection, business tax, and corporate law. Mike attended the Ohio State University in Columbus, Ohio, obtaining dual Bachelor of Science degrees in accounting and finance in 1986. Following college, he worked as a certified public accountant with Ernst & Young before returning to the Ohio State University for a JD, which he received in 1992. After receiving his JD, Mike went on to earn his LLM in taxation from Wayne State University in Detroit, Michigan in 1993. After completing this degree, Mike practiced state planning and tax law in a number of established firms before pursuing his own practice. Mike is licensed to practice law in Ohio, Michigan, Nevada, and California, He's also a certified financial planner. In addition to his professional endeavors, Mike is dedicated to his family and is an active member of his community. He's a past member of the board of directors for the Boys and Girls Clubs of Las Vegas. He is a former president of Southern, Estate, Southern Nevada State Planning Council and was legal counsel for the North Las Vegas Community Foundation. He's a former member of the Plan Giving Community for the Boulder Dam Area Council of the Boy Scouts of America and has been planned the, on the Plan Giving Committee for Heaven Can Wait Annual Animal Sanctuary. In his free time, away from the office, Mike is an avid cyclist, informally riding with the Red Burrow Racing. Mike raises money through his rides to give back to the causes closest to his heart. With that, please, enjoy, uh, please help me welcome Dr. Eric Bartman. Well, thank you. Let me, uh, let me share my screen. <laughs> so, if everything is going right, you should be seeing my first slide, which is the title slide. So since I don't hear anybody saying anything, I'll assume it's showing correctly. So. <clears throat> Carbon, I don't see it. I don't I, see it yet. You don't? No. Nope. Right. 
Let me see what's going on. Is that better? Yes. Okay, Perfect. sorry about that. Thank you. Yes. Thanks for the uh, nice introduction. Um, I kind of want to show my scout patches now instead of do this talk, but anyway. <laughs> um, so I'm going to talk about dementia and about diagnosing it and treating it. Um, and then, and then uh, Mike will tell you some more practical aspects of dealing with it. Before, before, and then at the end of both of our talks, there'll be a question and answer. So please uh, write your questions down, or I guess you can put them in the chat box. But I probably won't be able to answer most of them until the end. Um, before I begin, let's thank, uh, there we go. Before I begin, let me thank our sponsor, the Clark County Credit Union. Let me uh, give a moment to our sponsor to talk, and then I'll, and then I'll begin. Thank you, doctor. Clark County Credit Union, we're, uh, we're the medical field credit union, and we are very proud to be one of the sponsors for Roseman's Neighborhood Health Series. Uh, we've been around since 1951. If you ever need financial wellness, we're here for you with full banking services. Uh, what makes us better than a bank is that we're owned by our members. We are not for profit. And at the end of the year, we give our profits back to our members. Since the year 2000, our members have shared in over $68 million back into their accounts. You can visit us at ccculv.com.org, I'm sorry, .org, or you can call us at 702-228-2228. Enjoy tonight's presentation, and I'm sending it back over to Dr. Farben. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. So what is dementia? Well, I'm going to go give you general definitions and then go into more specifics. I will tell you that, generally speaking, when you hear dementia in the new, read dementia in the newspaper, hear it on the news, most of the time, almost every time, people use dementia and Alzheimer's disease interchangeably. But there actually are more dementias than just Alzheimer's. So dementia is an acquired deterioration in cognitive abilities, which leads to an impairment in daily function, in activities of daily living. Um, it affects over 4 million Americans. The total health care costs are greater than $100 billion. And memory loss is the most common symptom. If you just go by age alone, 10% of individuals over the age of 70 have identifiable memory loss and over 40% over the age of 85. Okay. Here's a list of all the dementias. The neurodegenerative ones are the ones that we often see in neurology. As I mentioned, Alzheimer's is the most common. There's vascular dementia, dementia with Lewy bodies, frontotemporal dementia. You can also have infections such as prion disease, which is like mad cow disease. Um, HIV can cause dementia. Neurosyphilis can cause cognitive problems, although it's not really dementia. Sometimes depression can look like dementia. Sometimes you can have drug-induced dementia. And you can get cognitive problems from nutritional or metabolic deficiencies, such as if you have low thyroid or if you're deficient in B12 or Wernicke's encephalopathy, which can occur with alcoholism. And finally, you can get dementia from structural problems, such as normal pressure hydrocephalus, if you have something that causes a loss of oxygen to the brain, or if you have a ble uh, bleed on the brain. So how do we determine the cause? Well, you know, if you go to the cardiologist with a heart problem, they'll do like an echo or an EKG. But with dementia, probably the most important thing is taking a good history. When did the symptoms begin? How quickly did they progress? Are activities of daily living involved? And who complains of the problems? For the most part, if the patient is complaining of the problems, it's actually usually not dementia. Whereas if the caregiver is complaining and the patient doesn't think they have dementia, it probably is. We also need to do a good physical exam, but a lot of times, for instance, with Alzheimer's disease, other than mental status, the neurological exam will be normal. So this pie chart, this pie graph, excuse me, shows you the different causes of the neurodegenerative disorders. And you can see that 60% of the time it's Alzheimer's disease and another 10 to 15% it's Alzheimer's disease plus vascular. 
So only about a quarter of the dementias are not Alzheimer's disease. As I mentioned, this is the most common cause of dementia in the United States. And by strict definition, you have problems with two cognitive domains. Memory is one, so you're forgetful, but the other can be executive functioning. For instance, trouble with planning or language, trouble with get, finding words. The annual cost for treatment of advanced Alzheimer's disease is over $50,000 a year. My numbers are a little bit old, so I think it's a lot higher now, but at least $50,000. And there's a heavy emotional toll on family members. Now, this shows the cause of death in 2004. So we're, you know, we're a number of years away, but, but you can see Alzheimer's in 2004 was the number seven cause. I believe it's actually higher now. Um, nothing to do with dementia, but it gives you an idea that we've had 530,000 deaths from COVID. It gives you an idea how much COVID has affected chances of death over the past year because um, this is 500,000, this line right here. The, uh, sorry, you can't see, this line right here. Oops, sorry. So how does Alzheimer's disease progress? Well, initially it's just mild memory loss. Maybe you have trouble finding a word. You get a little lost when driving. But slowly these begin to interfere with what we call instrumental activities of daily living. These are things that sort of make us human. And these are things like keeping a checkbook, uh, hobbies, trouble with driving, trouble with keeping control of the house. You then lose some social graces, routines, and eventually you have problems with activities of daily living. And this is like feeding oneself, dressing, cleaning. Then there's a loss of judgment and reasoning. You may get paranoia, you get delusions. And 10% of patients develop something called Capgras syndrome, where people think that their loved ones and family that they live with have been replaced with imposters. And it's hard to envision this, but I had a patient who came to me with her husband, for instance, and said, can you believe that this guy looks so much like my husband? And of course it was her husband. There can be loss of inhibitions and there can be difficulty with sleep-wake patterns such that when the caregiver wants to be asleep, the patient's awake. And so it can be very draining on the caregiver. If you look at Alzheimer's disease under the microscope, you can see volume loss. So the top two show, um, or I'm sorry, if you look at it, this isn't under a microscope, but this is gross pathology. So the top two show slices of the brain. On the right is a normal brain. On the left, you can see the, um, the big spaces in the brain are a lot bigger and you can see the curves of the brain. There's a lot more area. And the, the bottom shows the brain as a whole. Again, you can see here's a normal brain. And here I hope you can, on the left, I hope you can appreciate that the, uh, the spaces of the brain are a lot bigger because the, the brain is shrunk. Under the microscope, you can see plaques and tangles and you can see the stain the uh, sort of rust colored stain or the plaques and tangles in the brain. You may have heard of PET scans. PET scans can actually show pathology in living people. The other two are on autopsy, but in a living person, you can get a PET scan. And this is a, this particular PET scan that I'm showing is not actually available clinically. It's a research study it was done at University of Pittsburgh, but you can see the normal brain, you can see it's very blue, there's nothing lighting up. Whereas the Alzheimer brain, you can see the yellow and even the orange in particular shows the protein the, uh, that's accumulating in the Alzheimer's brain. So what we look for in the history are the following things. First of all, age is the biggest risk factor. At age 65, there's about a five to 6% chance. At age 95, there's about a 50% chance. Another thing is who has noticed the memory problems? Again, if it, there, and this has been shown actually in studies, but in, in a study in Eastern Europe, when the patient presented 
complaining of memory problems, it was only Alzheimer's about 5%. When they were brought by a family member, it was about 95%. And the reason it's brought by a family member is it's almost as though the patient is forgetting that they're forgetting. Um, what are the activities that the patient's having problems with? Have they had a problem? Have they had a change in maintaining their checkbook? They were always diligent and now they're not. Uh, have they lost their ability to cook, for instance? Are they doing dangerous things like leaving the stove on or leaving the water running? And how long have there been problems? You know, if they tell you the problems started one week ago, that's not usually Alzheimer's. Usually it's a little bit more vague. Usually it's been a year, maybe two. So what do we do on exam? Well, we might do a mini mental state exam, which is a 30 point thing. And I'll show you that in just a second, which can check different aspects of memory. A mini mental state exam is useful if the patient has Alzheimer's, but it's not useful for other dementias. There's something called a clock test, which may be more accurate. And we also like to test language. So we, if you check with somebody with Alzheimer's, even advanced Alzheimer's, you may say, if you say, how are you doing? They may say, good, how are you? But if you really dig, if you ask them about hobbies, about what's going on in the news, about what's on TV, they may have a lot of trouble. And in very advanced disease, patients may actually look like they have some Parkinson disease symptoms. This sort of shows you the mini mental state exam. And as you start losing points, what you lose. At first, you may just lose the ability to keep appointments or use the telephone or doing stuff with getting food. As it gets more advanced, you may have more trouble with traveling, selecting clothes, finding belongings. And then as it gets more severe, just simple things like eating or walking can become more difficult. This shows you somebody with an advancing minimum mental state exam. The top is the clock test. So they were asked to draw a clock, put all the numbers on and put the hands on. So at the one on the left with the least amount of impairment, they get all the numbers pretty good. They don't get the hands right. In the middle one, you can see the numbers aren't quite where they're supposed to be. And again, there's no hands. And this is the same patient, by the way, over time. And then in the right, when they're really advanced, you can see they put the numbers in, but not anywhere where they would go. And, um, and obviously there are no hands. The bottom shows how they did with the intersecting pentagons. So what you ask somebody to do is you ask them to draw two pentagons and have them intersect such that they form a four-sided figure. So the one on the left is correct. You can see the four-sided figure in the middle. The one in the middle isn't quite correct. They drew two intersecting pentagons, but if you look, the figure that intersects is also five-sided. And then the one on the right is clearly incorrect. So what do we do if we think somebody has Alzheimer's disease? Well, anybody that comes with memory, I should say anybody who comes with memory impairment, I shouldn't say automatically Alzheimer's disease, but anybody that comes with memory impairment, um, we, we always do brain imaging um, either an MRI or a CT scan of the brain. If, since we're usually only doing one scan, I will usually get an MRI scan unless the patient can't have an MRI scan either because they have metal in their body or because they're so advanced that they probably won't be able to lie still for the MRI. A CT scan really only takes about one minute to do. An MRI could take 20 minutes. And there's a couple of blood tests that we do. We check thyroid, and we check a vitamin B12 level. Now, what other things could be done? These are other tests that could be done, but most of the time we don't do them because all they do is waste time and money. You could do a PET scan on somebody, but for somebody who you suspect Alzheimer's, I don't think the PET scan adds anything. There are genetic tests you can do, and I list the three genes, three of the genes here, and these genes are similar to like eye color genes. If you have this gene, you will get Alzheimer's. The thing is, is there's probably only about a hundred families in the world with these genes. So they're really not helpful. There are susceptibility genes. Susceptibility genes increase your risk of getting something, but they don't guarantee you'll get it. And they don't tell you when you'll get it. 
So there are genes that are abbreviated ApoE, Apo epsilon, and there are some that increase your risk and some that reduce your risk. They're useful in research studies. They are not useful clinically. And you could do a biopsy of the brain, I suppose, and look for those plaques and tangles, but that's very invasive. And again, I don't know why you would do that when you can do all the other stuff. We do have some medications that are approved for Alzheimer's. Most of them are in a class called acetylcholinesterase inhibitors. Acetylcholine is a chemical that's normally found in the brain and it's low in patients with Alzheimer's disease. Acetylcholinesterase inhibitors block the breakdown of this medicine so that the, uh, block the breakdown of this protein so that the chemical stay, stays around longer. And so these medicines um, are all approved for mild to moderate dementia. Um, the first one that was on the market is one that was called Tacrin, um, but it was like four times a day and had liver disease. Um, we never prescribed this anymore. I've never prescribed this in my career. Um, the first one that came out that we actually prescribe nowadays is called Denepazil. And uh, this is actually also proof for severe Alzheimer's. And again, it helps to reduce the breakdown of acetylcholine so that it stays around longer. Rivastigmine is another one that's approved. This blocks another chemical called butylcholinesterase. Whether that means anything clinically, we don't really know. And the third one, uh, the fourth one that's approved, the third one that we use, is called galantamine, which also modulates another receptor called a nicotinic receptor. Again, whether this does anything clinically, we don't know. And we don't know if any of these three are better than any of the others. They're, they're probably pretty similar in efficacy. The other medicine that's approved is called memantine, and this is an, what's called an NMDA antagonist. It's kind of like a rust proofer for the brain. And this is approved for moderate to severe disease. Interestingly, there has never been any study that shows any benefit in mild disease. So I don't put everybody on memantine, but if they have more advanced disease, it's helpful. And you would oftentimes add it to the other one. It's rare that we would take away the first one. So all there, there are a few issues with treatment. All of the current agents have modif, modest benefits at best. These are not home runs, unfortunately. They do not stop the disease. They do not cure, to the, cure the disease, but they slow down its progression. And interestingly, they may be more beneficial on the behavioral aspects of the disease rather than the cognitive. So if you take one of these, you're not suddenly going to do Nobel Prize winning physics. But if you've been having trouble where the patient goes to the bathroom but has trouble urinating in the toilet, then maybe they go in the bathtub or the sink, they may suddenly start going in the toilet. Now, there are many investigations looking at many other drugs, statins, non-steroidals, um, infusions. Unfortunately, there's no compelling evidence to recommend any medicines specifically for Alzheimer's disease. So even medicines that are already on the market, like the statins or the anti-inflammatories, have not shown any benefit. And of course, the infusions are only investigational right now. So you wouldn't be able to get those anyway. But there hasn't, unfortunately, every other trial has failed. We haven't had a successful trial in Alzheimer's in like 15 years for like a phase three trial, a trial that might lead to approval. What about alternative medicines? I see patients come in all the time on ginkgo biloba. We have a great trial that was published that showed no benefit. So right now, there are no alternative medicines that I would recommend. I would recommend saving your money. But there are still studies ongoing for new compounds. So hopefully something will show evidence. Biogen has a medication that they're really high on. The FDA has shown mixed, result, mixed uh, messages as to whether they're going to approve it or not. So we'll see what happens. So I've spent a lot of time, this is more than half my talk on Alzheimer's disease, and I spent this much time because this is the most common one, but I'm going to tell you about the other stuff now. 
So vascular dementia is typically taught that this is a dementia with a stepwise with decline, with abrupt drops, which correlate with strokes. This is not correct. What vascular, this, what I just described is more accurately termed multi-infarct dementia, meaning you have a stroke and you do worse and then you plateau and have a stroke and do worse. And that happens, but it's actually quite rare, but it can happen. What vascular dementia is, is it's more subtle. It typically begins in a patient with high blood pressure. It may begin after a stroke or an episode with cardiac surgery, but it's a slow progression. It progresses similarly to how Alzheimer's degrees, disease progresses, but then it tends to plateau as compared to Alzheimer's disease. If you look at an MRI, there can be substantial white matter disease. So this picture I'm trying to show you, if you look on the right, the, that's normal. If you look on the left, you can see where the arrows are pointing um, in the middle one, you can see the arrows are pointing to the white matter disease. And on the bottom, on the bottom um, image, it shows some small strokes. But you can see there's a lot of white matter disease in this picture. Now, just because you have white matter disease does not mean you will have vascular dementia. Almost everybody has vas some white matter disease. But if you have a substantial amount and you have cognitive problems, it could be vascular dementia. The treatment is to treat the vascular risk factors like blood pressure, cholesterol, diabetes. And there is some evidence for the acetylcholinesterase inhibitors, but it's not as robust as it is in vascular, as it is in Alzheimer's disease. Denepazil actually sought FDA approval, but was rejected. The mention with Lewy bodies is probably the next most common one. And it's sort of a combination of memory problems and Parkinsonism. Strictly speaking, both problems must start within one year of each other, by definition. Frequently, the memory problems fluctuate. Alzheimer's disease is sort of a, a relentless progression. Lewy body dementia is up and down. You have good days and bad days. It does progress, but it's more up and down. Uh, visual hallucinations are very prominent in this disease, and hypersomnia, excessive sleep, is very prominent. Now, this can be difficult to treat sometimes because the Parkinson medications can sometimes exacerbate memory problems. Typically, we try to stabilize the memory first. Rivastigmine is actually sort of FDA approved for this, but other acetylcholinesterase inhibitors will work and are often more effective in this than in Alzheimer's because the acetylcholine is lower in this than in Alzheimer's. Frontal temporal dementia is actually quite uncommon. It's, 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 I would term it rare. It presents very differently from the other dementias. Often actually affects younger individuals, such as patients in their 50s. As I mentioned, it's extremely uncommon, although it can be found with other neurological diseases, such as ALS or progressive supranuclear palsy, which is a, uh, an atypical Parkinson disorder. So the clinical characteristics, typically patients actually present with behavioral issues, such as depression. They may become socially withdrawn, and then they often may become very bizarre, for lack of a better word, and may become inappropriate, oftentimes disinhibited. Sometimes these patients almost look autistic. They can become hyper-artistic, uh, you know, do a lot of artwork. It's very interesting. I've never seen that, but the... Uh, the uh, national expert in FTD is at University of California, San Francisco, and he has all this amazing artwork as FTD patients have drawn. And uh, what's interesting though, is you may have all of the above, yet the memory may remain intact until much later on in the disease. And then suddenly there's a big drop. The treatment of this disease is very difficult. And unfortunately these patients do not respond to the acetylcholinesterase inhibitors, and they may become agitated on them. This is the one disease where I do recommend a PET scan. You can get a, a glucose PET scan, which shows uptake of glucose in the brain, and it will differentiate pet frontal temporal dementia from Alzheimer's. If, the, if their uptake is really low in the front, but normal elsewhere, it's probably Alzheimer's. If it's normal in the front, but reduced in the sides and back, 
that's probably Alzheimer's disease. And I, I have a picture of a, of a brain after a patient died from frontal temporal dementia. The right is the front of the brain, the left is the, the back, left is the rear. You can see on the right that the spaces between the brain are much greater than lower than behind. There's a lot more atrophy in the front than as you get further back. An interesting example is Phineas Cage. Now Phineas Cage did not have frontal temporal dementia, but what happened was this guy was a railroad worker and in 1848, he was, he was doing stuff on the railroad when an explosion forced a tamping iron, which is like a crowbar through the front of his skull. You can see the cartoon on the right. Um, he actually survived the accident with minimal physical inju injury, hard to imagine. However, after the accident, he changed. He had formerly been like a church going teetotaler and afterwards he became very profane. He wouldn't follow through with plans. He had very little patience, very little restraint. Um, and you can see the newspaper article that was dis discussing this in, in the uh, Vermont newspaper. Anyway, this shows you just some of the symptoms that could happen if you have problems with your frontal lobe. Obviously, most people don't get it by having a crowbar thrown through their frontal lobe. Now, when you go to the doctor, the important thing to think of is the reversible disorders, because obviously these are treatable. All of the stuff I just told you is unfortunately not curable and the treatment is helpful, but not super great. These disorders we can actually treat. Depression is very common, particularly as people get older. Um, one difference is on the exam, people give up. In Alzheimer's, if you ask them to remember something, they're gonna tell you stuff that's gonna be wrong. Whereas in depression, patients will just say, I, I don't know, I can't remember, I don't know. People just give up. Hypothyroidism can exacerbate memory conditions. It's something that we always check but honestly, it's unlikely to present like Alzheimer's. Usually it's a much slower thought process, but it's not the Alzheimer's forgetfulness. Vitamin B12 deficiency can cause significant memory problems, but not necessarily like Alzheimer's. And what's interesting is, is if you eat a hamburger, you probably get enough B12 for three months. But as people get older, they have trouble absorbing it. And that's why people might need B12 shots. These are easier to, these are if you have trouble absorbing it. <clears throat> Another reversible disorder might be a drug induced disorder. So I mentioned acetylcholine causing memory problems, but many, some medications are strongly anticholinergic. So these would cause memory problems. And so patients would wanna come off of these. So in the Parkinson's and to a lesser degree psychiatric world, there's medicines called trihexaphenidyl or benztropine. These were actually the first Parkinson medications because acetylcholine and dopamine in the brain are almost like they're on a seesaw. So if you lower one, you raise the other. But I would not want to put an older Parkinson patient on these. Oxybutyn is very common. I saw patients today on it. This is a, uh, a drug that's used for, um, for urinary incontinence or urinary urgency. There are now many other urinary urgency medicines out there. So I would strongly recommend not going on oxybutynin because it can, it can cause memory problems. Atropine is a medicine that is used in, um, like when the uh, ophthalmologist wants to look, wants to um, do stuff for your eyes. Um, but we wouldn't want you to be on this orally, um, which sometimes people are for various things because again, it can impact on memory. And finally, diphenhydramine. I haven't given many drug names. I'm using the chemical names, the generic names, but I'm gonna give you the drug name for this one. And the drug name for diphenhydramine is Benadryl, which is also the PM in over-the-counter medicines, like Tylenol PM. Now, if you take Benadryl once in a while, it's fine. But if you're taking a PM medicine every night to sleep, uh, that's pretty bad for your memory. So I would not recommend taking Benadryl. Normal pressure hydrocephalus. 
This has a triad of symptoms. It has progressive dementia. It has trouble with walking and urinary incontinence. If you catch it in time, it's curable. It's curable by putting a shunt, which is like a, a tunnel in the brain to take the fluid from the brain and you shunt the fluid to the, essentially to the stomach and you urinate out the uh, extra fluid. The problem is, is it will help the cognitive problems least of these three. So if the patient is profoundly demented, unfortunately, even if you discover it then, it's not clear that shunting will help. But if, you, if the patient's mildly memory problems, has trouble walking, urinary incontinence, it's something to really look for. The, the problems with gait are very distinctive. So it's not just any gait disorder. Um, typically, we look for it on MRI scans. And you can see, um, the, I'm showing you the, the MRIs. You can see the ventricles. Those are the big areas in the middle of the brain, normally they're much smaller. You can see these are taking up like half the brain. And you can see around the big ventricles, you can see sort of a, like a, a darker gray on the CAT scans and it's white on the CT. But the darker gray on the CT scans, um, which is this stuff, that's what's called transependymal spinal fluid. So you see a lot of that, you see the big ventricles, this is what you see on normal pressure hydrocephalus. If, if it's unclear, um, well, actually, I think I, oh no, I don't get to, if it's unclear based on the brain scan, then, um, then what we're, then we might do a spinal tap. We take off fluid. You take a lot of fluid off, the patient should walk better, but it's very transient. Within a few hours, that fluid will be back, but it helps to determine if it's um, the normal pressure hydrocephalus. This disease gets a lot of press. Every few years on a talk show or on 60 Minutes or even a direct to consumer advertisements, but on the talk show, there'll be somebody who appears on it where, where the story is, is that they were told they had Parkinson's, were told they had dementia, and eventually they were figured out that they had normal pressure hydrocephalus, and they got shunted, and then they got all better. And family members are desperate for this to be the case because it's curable. And whenever this, whenever this ad airs on one of those shows, the next week I get a lot of calls about from both from new patients, but also from existing patients. Are you sure I don't have this? And unfortunately, it's usually not the disease. Superficially, it can resemble Alzheimer's disease. It can resemble Parkinson's disease, but in practice, it's usually distinct and usually very different. Again, Parkinson patients can have trouble walking, but they walk differently than the trouble that NPH patients have. And same thing, the memory difficulties, unless it's profound, are usually different. So to summarize, age is the biggest risk factor for dementia. And a good history and physical exam are crucial. If the patient reports that he or she has had memory problems for many years, there may be no dementia at all. It may be depression. In fact, it's often depression. If a family member reports many years of memory problems, it probably isn't prion disorder, right? You know, the prion disorders are literally one in a million patients. Alzheimer's disease is much more common. It's probably that. And most of the time, it will be Alzheimer's disease. Like I said, I get, there are a lot of other things that dementia can be. But statistically speaking, it's almost always Alzheimer's disease. So that's my last slide. Um, this is my contact information. If you, um, you know, I don't necessarily want patients contacting me through email. I can't really answer you through email, but the, the phone number is, um, is uh, the phone number to my clinic if you, if uh, you want to make an appointment or, or if you're not a patient, if you have questions that you think of afterwards, um, I'm happy to answer them. I know I see questions on this slide, but I think if you could hold on to your questions and uh, I'm right on schedule and uh, I think we're going to move on to the next talk. But thank you for paying attention. I can't really see what you guys are doing. I hope you didn't all sleep during this talk. I know my parents are listening to this talk. I hope they stayed awake. So anyway, 
thank you for um, thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Farman, and that was an incredible presentation. Um, if you stop sharing, then I'll be able to share my screen. And as I get that up and running, if that's okay, there is a quick question I'd like to throw your way. Um, one of our guests asks about prevention. Do you mind talking about prevention? Oh, yeah, one that's, a good, that's a good question. So, um, you know, everybody always asks me, oh, should I take that to Nepazil, you know, to prevent Alzheimer's? And unfortunately, um, there's no evidence for that. Um, probably Alzheimer's begins, you know, years before you're diagnosed. So, you know, if, if the Dinepazil were to, were to do anything, you'd probably have to take it for decades. And we don't know that that has any benefit. What we do know that has benefit, the only thing that's been shown to be, have benefit, there was a retrospective study that looked at what people did and it looked at like jigsaw puzzles, crossword puzzles, lots of stuff like that. The only thing that showed any benefit, and there are problems with retrospective studies, but the only thing that showed any benefit was dancing. And dancing probably showed benefit because not only do you have to use your brain to think, where does my foot go, but it involves exercise. Exercise is probably the one thing that has benefit. You don't have to train for the Olympics, but if you do a little bit of exercise, if you do like 30 minutes of exercise five days a week, particularly cardiovascular, that probably helps reduce your risk. And of course, being healthy, eating healthy, that sort of thing. Education is also somewhat protective in terms of probably delaying the onset, but when it comes on, you often lose that benefit and it progresses or it progresses to where it would have been. So that's my long-winded answer. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. I hope everyone can see my screen now. Mike, can you see my screen? I can. Thank you. Dr. Farman, that was awesome. Um, that really helps because what you've done is talk through the different types of dementia and what the symptoms are that people can look out for, not only for themselves, but also for loved ones. And then it will lead us into how do we protect them when these things start to happen to us? My presentation is going to be a little bit different where we're going to start very basic and then we'll get a little more particular. I want to make sure that everyone has a proper foundation, proper understanding of the basics before we get into a little more of the particulars. So I always ask, and it's generally a, a, a trick question. And when I ask this question with nine out of 10 people, they always, even though I preface it with it's a trick question, they generally don't answer it correctly. And I always say, do you have an estate plan? And everyone says, no, I don't. Well, in fact, everyone does have an estate plan. The question is whether you draft it yourself or the state of Nevada or whatever state you're a resident of drafts it for you. We'll get into that. So preliminary question, what is estate planning? Right, and everyone has different definitions, but you can read on the screen what um, formal definition is, but my take is this. It's basically arranging your affairs, so your assets pass to whom you went, when you want, how you want, and you have the right people in place to take control of it when you are unable, whether that's through capacity or through your passing. So that's the base of the estate planning. What are the core estate planning documents? Well, generally speaking, you'll have a will, with all this last will and testament. You'll have a power of attorney for asset management. You'll have a power of attorney for health care. You'll have a living will. And then you could have a trust. Generally speaking, it's a revocable living trust that uh, is done for reasons that we'll get into. So the question then is, what are the differences? People want to know the differences between a will and a trust. And basically, a will is a public document. A will only governs assets that are subject to probate. And you could have multiple probates depending on if you own real property in multiple jurisdictions. A living trust, on the other hand, is a private instrument. It is not made public and no one else has to know what your business is. I usually ask people, have you heard anything about Robin Williams when he passed? 
And generally speaking, everyone goes, well, I haven't heard anything about him. I don't know. Well, have you guys read anything about Tony Shea? It's in the news. It's going to be in the news. You're going to know exactly what he owns. Part of that reason is it's a probate process, which is public. So then we'll get into the next slide, which is talking about what is a will. Very simply, here's my definition. A, a will is a formal document that you prepare that expresses your desires of how to dispose of your assets through the probate process, right? You can see the very bottom line on this slide. It says where there's a will, there's a probate. That's the estate planning sense of humor. You can tell that they're jovial people and have a good sense of humor. Or instead of there's a will, there's a way, there's a will, there's a probate. So a will only governs assets subject to probate. The biggest misconception that people have is a will avoids probate. And that is 100% incorrect. A will only governs assets that are subject to probate. I'll give you an illustration. I have a will. My will leads everything to a charity. I'm not giving anything to my wife. I'm not giving anything to my kids. I'm just a bad guy. But all of my assets are joint tenancy with right of survivorship with my wife, Anne. Now, my will leaves everything to charity. All of my assets are joint tenant with my wife. If something happens to me, does charity get anything? Most people go, oh, they're the sole beneficiary of your will. Of course, they get everything. The answer is they get nothing because nothing is subject to probate. All right? So then the question becomes, what is probate? Ah, somebody even asked that question. Perfect timing. What is probate? Probate is, in its simplest form, a process to transfer legal title. That's what probate is about. I will tell you, here's the example. Again, if I have an asset in my name and I pass, who owns that asset? My wife, Anne, will say, listen, I've been married to this guy for 30 years, right? It's community property. It's mine. Right. And the answer is, hey, you know, she's right. Everything she's saying is correct, except for Nevada law says that if an institution or other custodian gives an asset to someone who's not the rightful owner, then the rightful owner has a claim against that institution. For example, I have a bank account in my name alone that I received by gift or inheritance. That's not community property. That's my separate property. Maybe I have a creditor claim for professional liability for automobile negligence, whatever the case is. If I have a creditor claim who has a superior right and they give it to someone who's not the rightful owner, then they're on the hook. So as a matter of policy, every institution will say, time out, give me a court order. As soon as you give me a court order, I will then go ahead and give you the asset. That's what probate is. How do you avoid probate? You avoid probate by first joint tenancy right of survivorship. That means Mike and Ann, husband, wife, joint tenant right of survivorship. If something happens to me, it pass, passes to her by operation of law, regardless of what my will says. Another asset that's not subject to probate, anything with a beneficiary designation. Most people that have, um, Life insurance or retirement accounts understand this principle. So the reason you avoid probate is in the beneficiary designation, you have contracted with the institution that says, if something happens to me, make the payment to this person. So remember what probate was? Probate is the process of transfer title. So if I designated who the owner is, then we generally avoid probate because we have the contract for to whom that institution shall make the payment. Other assets generally not subject to probate, beneficiary designations like the TOD, transfer on death, POD, pay on death. And in a bank account, you can do something called an ITF, which is in trust for. Another way to avoid probate is a living trust, right? 
I'll go back a little bit. I'm not quite there yet, Vanessa. So one of the advantages of going through probate is that the court oversees the distribution of your estate, meaning what you have in your will will happen for sure with the court overseeing it. The biggest disadvantage of probate is the court oversees the distribution of your estate. Wait a minute, I thought I just said that as an advantage. It's a disadvantage because you have to dot every I, cross every T, which takes time and it can be expensive. I always ask people, and I wish I could get hands, but what, what does everyone think the single largest expense associated with probate is? Now, I'm smiling a little bit, you can't really tell that, but if you guess attorney fees, you're right. The large, it's not taxes, it's not the state of Nevada, it's not court filing costs, it's attorney fees, not taxes. In Nevada, we have no estate tax, all right? I'll get into the advantages of a trust in a little bit. That's generally the federal estate tax. So we'll talk about that in just one second. By statute, attorneys are allowed to take 4% of the first 100,000, 3% of the next 100,000, 2% of the next 800,000, 1% of the next 9 million, half a percent of the next 15 million. Okay, is that enough? All right, plenty, right? So people go, oh, wait, Mike, I only have a house. My house is worth $300,000. I'm going to do a very simple will to pass it to my adult children. If that house goes through probate, let's talk about the fee would be the attorney fee. 4% plus 3, 4,000 plus 3,000 plus another 2,000. So that's a $9,000 attorney fee just to pass your house to your children. So in Nevada, we have a couple of options. One would be joint tenancy. I'm okay with joint tenancy with a spouse. I do not like joint tenancy with anyone other than a spouse. The reason for that is you're potentially losing control over your asset. I name my child as a joint tenant on the house. Something happens to me, it'll pass to that child by operation of law. The answer is that's correct. But what if that child had a creditor claim? You've made them an owner. There's potential that you lose your asset by making someone else an owner. So I'm not a big fan of that because of your potential loss of control. So now we ask, what if I don't have a valid testamentary disposition? No valid will, no trust. You then die what's called intestate, right? It's through, still through the probate process, right? But the state of Nevada has directed where your state will pass. The theory, and this is true in every state, regardless of where you are. The theory of intestate succession is this is probably what most people would have wanted if they put it on paper, right? So it says in Nevada, if it's a community property asset, it goes to a spouse. If it's a non-community property asset and you're married with kids, it goes half part spouse, part kids. And it depends on the number of children, how that division works. If I have no spouse, I have kids, it goes to my kids. And that's kind of what most people have wanted. So the idea is, hey, we think this is the best we can do if you don't really take care of it yourself. So I'm not a big fan of letting the state of Nevada draft your estate plan for you. Um, one other advantage of a will that I did not mention that I should, that we'll get into, is that in your will, you can nominate who you want to be your guardian in case of your incapacity. One other thing that the state of Nevada does, we have a living lockbox with the Secretary of State. In that lockbox, you can do a couple of things. One, you can register your living will and power of attorney for health care, which I'll get into in a little bit. And you can also nominate that person with the Secretary of State. And therefore, it's a matter of public record of who you want to be your guardian in case there's ever a need that arises. Okay, I will understand that. So <clears throat> I'm gonna move on to the next slide, which is, again, avoiding probate. How do we do it? It's with a living trust. A lot of people have a living trust and a lot of people do not know really what it is. Um, but a living trust essentially is an alternate form of ownership. Instead of Mike and Ann owning everything as husband and wife or as joint tenants, or I name Ann as a beneficiary on my investment account, it's now Mike and Ann Kling as trustees of the Kling Family Trust. 
So think of the trust as a holding tank, and we now put the assets into that holding tank. So now the trust will govern the disposition of those assets. In a properly structured trust, it says during my lifetime and Anne's lifetime, we are the beneficiaries of that trust. If something happens to one of us, then the assets will pass to the survivor or however we've directed. And then if something happens to both of us, we've now directed how the assets will be passed free of the probate process. Why does it avoid probate? Because remember, think of the trust as a holding tank. We put assets in from our individual name and put them into the trust. The trust now owns those assets. If something happens to me and becomes the successor trustee to manage those assets in a fiduciary capacity, meaning she must administer the trust pursuant to its terms. Well, it's fine because it's for her. But if something happened to both of us, now we have named a successor trustee, right? Someone else to come in in a fiduciary capacity to now administer those assets. So, Probate is a process to transfer title. If I have assets in my trust, I have named the, the assets are in the trust, titled in the trust. Therefore, I've named a fiduciary to manage those assets. We know who owns them and know who's the right to manage them. So a trust is generally a, re, a means to avoid probate. What are the other main advantages of a trust? Generally speaking, we used to talk about the federal estate tax. We'll get into that in a second, but it's probate avoidance, which we just talked about. It's control, we'll talk about in a second. It's private, and it generally eliminates the need of a guardian. So let's talk about the federal estate tax, because we had that question before, oh, probate taxes. In Nevada, there aren't any estate taxes. There aren't any inheritance taxes, but there is a federal estate tax. That federal estate tax is now an exemption from it up to $11.7 million per person. So uh, if, if you have an estate over 11.7, I want you to go ahead and send me a chat right now, wave your hand, put up your hand, do something because we need to do something about it, right? Now, when I say 11.7, everyone goes, eh, well, whatever, done, who cares? And that's true. However, with the new administration that we are talking some tax changes that are on the, the horizon. They will occur. The question is when, we don't know. A lot of people speculate it will not be this calendar year. It may or may not be. Another speculation is when they do pass these tax law changes, will they make it retroactive to the beginning of the year? So many people go, no, 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 you can't do that. The answer is sure you can. There have been two Supreme Court cases that have said it is constitutional to do that. So estate taxes is one reason we would create the trust. Probate avoidance is another. Control, think of control as you pass the assets to whom you want, when you want, how you want, right? Think of it as a will substitute. I want my children to get it, but I don't want them to get it till they're old enough or mature enough. I want my, my grandkids to get it, but only for education. So you can control to do that. We talked about private a little bit. Again, Robin Williams versus Tony Shea. And let's talk about the need for the guardian. Why does it eliminate the need of a guardian? Well, it doesn't entirely, but generally speaking, a guardian is appointed to manage assets, right? In Nevada, we have two types of guardian. We do not have a conservatorship. We have a guardian over the estate and a guardian over the person. Guardian over the person is the person that you, residential decisions. Where can the person that can't make decisions for themselves live? Guardian over the estate is who gets to make financial decisions. But if I have my assets properly titled in a trust, then I already have a fiduciary in place that must, by the terms of the trust, administer those assets pursuant to that those terms, which is for my care. So I'm not saying that it's the end all be all, because sure, you get a someone breach of fiduciary duty, so we have to be very careful who the trustees are. In the 20 years I've been having my law firm, I have only needed a guardian one time when we had a trust. 
And it was because the children couldn't agree of where mom and dad should live. Mom and dad used to live in California, but they're showing the symptoms that doctor um, was talking about, which was leaving on the stove, forgetting to take pills, right? Had clear symptoms of some form of dementia. Daughter was living here and knew some great facilities and said, I'm bringing mom and dad over and actually moved mom and dad into an assisted living facility. When daughter talked to mom and dad, she said, how do you like it here? Oh, we love it here. Thank you so much. I'm so glad you did this. The son would call and say, hey, mom and dad, don't you want to move back home? Don't you miss your house? And they go, oh, yeah, I can't wait. I, I, yeah, I want to move back home. So son says, hey, I'm coming over to get mom and dad. The daughter goes, no. So the daughter goes to the assisted living facility and says, hey, if my brother comes over, don't let him take mom and dad. And they said, are you your parents' guardian? She said, no. And they said, well, if mom and dad are walking out the door, they get to just wave bye-bye, we can't stop them. So we had to have a guardian because the kids couldn't agree on where mom and dad should be residing. So generally speaking, it eliminates it because it's over financial matters, we have a fiduciary. The biggest disadvantages of a trust are, it costs a lot more than a will, but it costs a lot less than probate and funding the trust. This is critical. Most attorneys want to tell you the trust is the greatest thing since sliced bread, but they don't tell you how to get the benefit of the trust, that you have to retitle your assets, change beneficiary forms. They may help you with some ancillary matters, like, oh, the deed to the house, it's easy because it's public record, but not how to go to the bank, how to go to your institution, how to change beneficiaries on life insurance or retirement accounts. Now, I will tell you the biggest problem is if I was your attorney, and now that you guys, I've talked to you for just a few minutes, you go, hey, I like this guy. I'm going to trust him with all of my assets. I'm going to give Mike a power of attorney, right? Because that's the only way I can sign your name. Would you ever do that? I hope everyone is shaking their head. Absolutely not. Never, ever, right? You will never give anyone else authority over your assets unless you're incapable of doing it yourself. That's my fundamental principle. There may be some other circumstances, but generally speaking, I cannot go to your bank. I can't go to your financial institution. I can facilitate, but I physically can't sign your name. So you have to understand the concept and how to do it. That is, a, it is an obstacle. It's one we can overcome. But if you have a trust and assets aren't properly titled, you are not getting the benefits of that trust. Other documents that we'll keep moving on, Vanessa, is your power of attorney for asset management, power of attorney for healthcare, and a living will. Power of attorney for asset management, there are two types, springing and a general durable. A general durable says, I'm giving you the authority over my assets today right now. Why would we do that? Well, we'd only do that as, hey, I'm going on a vacation. I'm trying to sell my real estate. The closing is the day I'm gone. I want someone for a limited period of time to have the ability to close on my house, right? But, you know, with today's technology, that comes into play very rarely. A springing durable says, the authority I'm giving someone else only springs into power upon my incapacity. Generally speaking for, and I'm saying that too much, for the power of attorney for asset management, two licensed physicians state you're no longer capable of handling your own affairs. So it's from an asset management perspective. The one thing that you have to be aware of is in Nevada, we adopted the Uniform Power of Attorney Act. This form is designed to kind of fit anything and everything out there. So you have to be very careful on A, what does it govern? And B, what powers you're giving your agent. We have started to imply a fiduciary duty to your agent, but it is not as much of a fiduciary duty as a trustee. And in the power of attorney form, there, are, there is the ability under the Uniform Act to give your agent the power to create a trust, to amend a trust. Right to change rider survivorship, to change beneficiary forms. 
you have to be very careful of if you want someone else to have that authority. I personally do not believe that should be the case unless there are circumstances that warrant it. The two health care forms that are critical in your estate plan is that power of attorney for health care and the living will. A living will is basically death is imminent and there's no meaningful chance of long-term recovery or survival. That's what your living will. It's not the equivalent of the DNR, but it's close to a DNR. And in Nevada, we have two types of living wills, an advanced directive and a declaration. An advanced directive is saying, hey, my attending physician can make the determination of whether or not they should do anything. A, um, a declaration is you can name people to do that. I, I, again, personally like having some control in naming the people that will be able to make healthcare decisions for me if I can't. So I like naming the family or the trusted person that will make it if I'm incapable of doing it. Power of attorney for healthcare is basically, I just can't give informed consent. I am incapacitated. At that point in time, the person can make routine to life support decisions. It's generally for life support decisions, but it's only in the event I'm incapable of giving informed consent. Um, next slide, Vanessa, please. So we get into who can create a valid plan. And this kind of gets back into Dr. Farman's, if you have capacity, dementia or not. It's very interesting because to have testamentary capacity, to make a valid will, a valid trust, all you have to know is if I'm married and my spouse is, or my kids and my kids are, and what I own, right? So it's not a very big hurdle to clear to have testamentary capacity. The one thing in Nevada that obviously, even if I have testamentary capacity, it may be void or voidable if my estate plan is created under fraud, duress, or undue influence. That is 100% different than capacity, right? I have capacity, but someone else is influencing me to do this. Very interesting, a few years ago, Nevada created a new statute that talked about a presumption of a will being void if the will passed to certain people. And it's a caregiver, right? All of a sudden, mom's got a new will and all the assets are going to a caregiver. That is void, right? Unless you get what's known as a certificate of independent review. The person has to hire another attorney to do an independent review of the circumstances and determine that is what that person wanted. Another way to have a voidable will, even though you have capacity, is if the person that assists you as materially participates in it and benefits from it. There are exceptions to that and it's if it's a spouse. The reason for that is, again, under normal circumstances, most people want their assets to pass to a spouse and so therefore they created that rebuttable presumption. Again, it's a rebuttable presumption, which means if you have to prove it in court, if you go into clear and convincing evidence that it was created and it should be void. Let's talk a little bit about a guardian. So as you can tell from the time I've talked, which I'm getting close to the end, I'm really an estate attorney, but a guardianship is really when someone is incapable of managing their own affairs. I've created a slide and I don't know if you can get to it, Vanessa, about incapacity. Um, is one of the, the last slides. And I just put in the exact definition under Nevada law about what is capacity. This is almost verbatim in the guardianship statute. And Dr. Farben, I'd love to hear what you think about this because it says a person who's unable to receive and evaluate information or make or communicate decisions to such an extent that the person lacks the ability to meet essential requirements of physical health, safety, or self-care without appropriate assistance. Now, is that clear? Does everyone understand what that means? That's our definition. So if we have to have a guardian appointed, that is the burden of proof that the person filing the guardianship petition would have to prove, right? But 
how do you do that? And it's generally, you know, Dr. Farman has mentioned times that they they lose the ability to care for themselves, right? Um, you would get the physician's statement. Um, you would have an affidavit. The one interesting thing about Nevada guardianship with an adult ward, or per, they call it protective person, my apologies, is that when a petition is filed for a guardianship, the court must appoint an attorney to represent the alleged protected person, right? The one that is deemed or alleged to be incapacitated. The only exception to that is if that person can hire an attorney themselves and does so. So let's go on to the next slide. This types of guardian, we talked about that briefly over the person, over the estate. And there is a combination that I could have a guardian over the person and the estate. Uh, move on to the next slide. I think I'm running pretty much out of time. So the, the biggest one that I want everyone to be aware of is people can make decisions that you may not agree with. And if they have testamentary capacity, it actually does withhold scrutiny. The question always is, is did someone else influence them? That a different matter than capacity. The biggest thing I think you should take away from this regarding guardianship, and just to take a step back for a second, in the last couple of years, we've had a lot of press about Nevada guardianships. And we've had the necessary steps, safeguards in place in our statute for many years. The problem is we did not have the appropriate systems in place where the court made sure that people were following the, the formalities that were required. Now with the, the people that have been convicted of misappropriating funds, uh, we are now making sure people file the necessary words, necessary documents. However, the point I wanna make is be proactive, right? Not only with making sure you have the proper documents in place, but also the, the necessary nomination of who you want to act if you can't act yourself. Not only from an asset perspective, but also from a healthcare perspective and from a guardianship perspective. You can make those necessary uh, nominations. The court will defer to those nominations unless you've clearly nominated someone that's inappropriate, which most people never do. The other thing I want you to be aware of is communication. Communication is, in my opinion, one of the most overlooked but essential matters in everyone's overall planning. Why do most people want to challenge someone's will or challenge something else? It isn't really because of undue influence or duress. They'll, they'll say that's the reason, but it's expectations. Mom and dad, who I haven't talked to them about their estate plan forever, I have no idea what they really want. I'm assuming as a child that I'm going to get everything or my one share or whatever the case is. And then all of a sudden, mom and dad's estate plan is not the way that we expect it to be. So our natural response is something must have happened, right? So if you have, and here's my, my philosophy when I practice, if folks are doing what is pretty natural. Hey, I have my children. I'm leaving my assets to my kids. That's kind of what we'd expect. If all of a sudden it's doing something different, then I encourage, this is not a legal matter, but I encourage to have a conversation with the family to let them know, right, that this is what they should expect. And so therefore, when it happens, they go, oh, that's what I thought. That's what mom and dad told me. As opposed to, are you kidding me? I can't believe they did this. No way that's right. But anyway, I, I've run over time. I think Vanessa, we can go to questions. So I do appreciate it very much. At the very end, I do have, if you have questions or concerns that I can't get to, I'm happy to go ahead and address those. So again, thank you for your time. Hopefully again, like Dr. Farman said, I didn't put many of you asleep. I see some now tops of heads, so maybe I did, but anyway, thank you. Okay, looks like we have some questions here in the chat. Uh, the first question is from Dee, and she says, the effects of Ambien 
and Zolpidem for Dr. Farman. Yeah, so Ambien, Zolpidem, Zolpidem is just a chemical name for Ambien. These are uh, sleeping pills. Um, and they can be anticholinergic. Remember, acetylcholine was the chemical that we don't want to be low. If you're using it once in a while, it's probably okay. But most people that are on Ambien take it every day for years. You're not even supposed to take it more than a few weeks. So um, I would say if somebody has a dementing illness, you probably don't want to give them Ambien. You certainly don't want to give it to them every day. I agree. We have a question for Mike. Do you know how similar laws are in Nevada compared to Utah? Um, it, it depends on the nature of the question, but uh, from a living trust perspective, generally speaking, each state is very uniform and test state succession is very uniform. The most significant difference between Utah law and Nevada law is Nevada is a community property state Nevada, uh, Utah is not. So that has to be a consideration when completing one's estate plan. Right, and how does a second spouse or second marriage um, affect some of the documents you talked about? Uh, great question. <clears throat> so obviously, I want to make sure it reflects goals and desires and need to understand the practical potential ramifications of doing a boilerplate plan. When you do boilerplate plans, generally speaking, safeguards are not included in that plan. And as a result, there could be consequences that you would be unaware of. I'll give you a real quick example. Hey, I don't have an $11.7 million estate. This is second marriage. We create a joint trust together. And so if something happens to one spouse, everything passes to the surviving spouse. So then the surviving spouse can do anything he or she wants. After a couple of years of not hearing from the first spouse's kids, I don't get the birthday card, I don't get a Christmas card, I don't hear from them anymore. Generally speaking, the surviving spouse says, why am I leaving my assets to some kids that don't care about me? So there's potential that you could have an unintended consequence if the thought is not put into the plan. Okay, Mike, and how about California? How does California compare to Nevada and Utah law? Well, California's community property states are very similar to Nevada. Great. We have a question of whether or not you're licensed in the state of Utah, Mike. I am not licensed in the state of Utah. I've only taken four bar exams and I don't want to take another one. <laughs> okay. And is there an assigned trustee and a power of attorney for healthcare? Will there still need to be a guardian assigned? So I talked about that just they, again, it depends on the, the purpose. If the guardian is needed for over the person uh, because someone questions whether they have the right to make that residential decision, then yes, you would need the guardian. Uh, if it's over the estate, if everything's properly titled, then a trust should eliminate that guardianship. If I have a power of attorney and I'm relying on that document to control, most institutions look on powers of attorney with a very healthy sense of skepticism. It's a valid document, but it may not achieve your objectives. Okay, we have another question for you, Mike. What is the role of a pour over will? Also, how often should a living trust be updated? So I call my pour over will an oops document. Oops, we have a probate. So everyone, if you have a trust, you must have a pour over will. It's a safeguard. It's a, hey, I forgot to title or I meant to title or I didn't title something correctly. If there is a probate, you want the assets to pour over into the trust, i.e. a pour over will. So you will absolutely have it. And the second part of that question, Vanessa, sorry. Was how often should a living trust be updated? My recommendation, I believe you should pull out your estate plan documents at a minimum on an annual basis. You should do look at four main areas every year. You should look at the tax provisions of the trust to make sure that they are correct. Two, look at the distribution. Are your assets passing to whom you want, when you want, how you want? Three, do we have the right people in place, not only from an asset perspective, but also healthcare and guardianship? Four, 
are my assets properly titled to proper beneficiaries? Do that checkup every year. And if you're not in your head, this is good, this is what I want, this is what I want, then yes. But probably if you do that and you don't understand it completely, then probably warrants you know, consulting with an attorney to make sure that it is what you want. And, and I don't think you have to do that as frequently as you know, every year, but it should be somewhat periodic every five to seven years. Okay. Um, we have one more for you, Mike, and then we're going to pivot over to Dr. Fardman. Can you hire an attorney for probate with an hourly rate as opposed to a percentage of your assets? That is, yes, you can. So you do not have to go with the statutory rate. Uh, you can hire someone on the, the their hourly rate, correct. Okay. Actually, there's one more question. What are ways of funding the trust? So funding is basically just retitling the asset. So I, I have to go to my bank and take it from Mike and Ann as husband and wife to Mike and Ann as trustees of the Kling Family Trust. Take a certificate of trust or trust abstract to that institution and you will retitle the account. If it's real estate, you have to do a deed. If it's life insurance, a change of beneficiary form. If it's a retirement account, change of beneficiary form. But it is something that you affirmatively have to do. It is not passive. It will not happen by itself. You must take care of it yourself. Thank you, Mike. We'll give you a break here. We'll move on to Dr. Fardman. Uh, we have two questions. Is there something in particular that may cause or contribute to early onset or frontal temporal dementia? Uh, there's nothing that we know of that probably contributes to any of the any of the um, neurodegenerative diseases, um, frontal temporal, Alzheimer's, or or Lewy body dementia. Okay, Dr. Furman, what did you think of uh, the Nevada law's definition of incapacity? If would you like me to read it again? Yeah, yeah. no, I, I looked at it when he said it. You know. I joke that, you know, like, so we are always taught in medical school that capacity is a legal thing, not a medical thing. But it, what's interesting is, like, if you're, if you're rounding in the hospital and you want to do something with the patient, you want to do a procedure, and they agree with you, then we never assume that they're unable to, it's kind of weird, but we assume that they're competent, you know, we assume, you know, we're, so if I say, if I say, hey, uh, you know, we want to do this thing where we take your hands off and put it on the other arms, and the patient goes, yeah, I'm up for it. I never assume that they're incapacitated. Whereas if I say, I want, you know, I want to do this, and they disagree with me, that's when we get everything involved, like, oh, they must be. So I think some of it's a little bit of arrogance on the doctor's part, but um, <clears throat> I mean, in general, I don't know, maybe I'd have to look at it again. To, to specifically comment, but um, we we do know that it's a legal thing. You know, I, I guess where it becomes tricky, fortunately this hasn't happened too much, but if everybody's on the same page, if the whole family is in agreement and, and I sort of agree with what they're thinking, then there's not really a problem. The problem becomes when, you know, one child wants one thing and another child wants another thing and, or if doc and doctors disagree, then it becomes a big issue. If you if you want to put it up on the screen, I can comment specifically. I didn't see anything on there that jumped out at me, but I'll read it to you. And 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 from my understanding, um, proving incapacity is often a humiliating experience for the person, and so families don't want to go through that knowing how painful that could be for the person. Um, comment, Vanessa. Yeah, to, to prove it. I mean, it's an open court. This is not a closed proceeding, and you have to have evidence presented against that person. They have to be presented in the court, so they have to be present unless the judge specifically excludes that person. So they know that they're being talked about, and this is. And so, it is. It's one of the processes that is. People don't enjoy, and if you can avoid it, please try to do so. Yeah. Um, the person lacks the ability to meet essential requirements for physical health, safety, or self-care without appropriate assistance. I mean, yeah. I mean, I completely agree with that. But the problem is, is when a family's fighting about it, you know, and sometimes 
sometimes they all have their patient's best interests at heart, but maybe disagree. But sometimes, you know, it may be an issue of, you know, that, that maybe somebody is trying to take advantage of the patient. Um, another thing that happens, this may, this may be less capacity and more competence, which is more medical thing in the hospital. But what happens is, is that the, the child that's been taking care of the parent for many years, like wants to basically, basically says, look, the parent wouldn't want this to continue. And then another child who hasn't seen the Pitt family in many years flies in and perhaps out of guilt says, do everything. And then the patient gets caught in the middle. That's probably more competence than capacity, but it's a similar, it's a similar issue. Okay. Dr. Furman, you touched on this a little bit. Um, the future of Alzheimer's disease research and treatment. You said there are potentially some, some trials coming up, but that there doesn't appear to be a lot of bright spots in the future for yeah, Alzheimer's. Yeah, well, the, I, I don't want to become, sound completely negative. The, the big negative thing is, unfortunately, things haven't panned out. And it, some of it may be that it's that we're starting too late. So, you know, if the system has already started to go a little haywire, um, you know, it's possible that we're starting too late. It becomes a delicate balance, though. If you have an, an infusion, so there's a lot of infusion therapies now, they're antibody therapies. Um, how long are you going to treat people on an infusion to try to prevent Alzheimer's? I mean, you know, are you going to do it for 10 years? I mean, that, no drug company would ever do that. Forget about the humanitarian issues, just be too expensive. The big push for research now is to try to do it at mild cognitive impairment, which is maybe not normal memory, but not Alzheimer's either. So that um, you know, starting a little bit earlier, maybe it'll 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 show something. The other thing is, is that PET scan that I showed with the Pittsburgh compound. Again, I would not recommend that for clinical, but it may be very useful in trials because it may show changes quicker allow us to, to, to do studies with fewer patients, which can save money, which may allow us to do it longer. So, um, but the big, and the other thing is, and this may be a little bit more on the negative side is the question about the acetylcholine hypothesis, which was a big part of my talk, that may not be the only issue in Alzheimer's. And so everything's, at least early on, was going down that road Maybe we need to go some other pathways. Okay, thank you. Um, just one final question, it looks like. Um, one comment, Mike is licensed in the state of California. And the final question is, um, where is the trust recorded? So in Nevada, it is not required to be recorded. So it is a private document. That's one of the advantages of a living trust is that it's a private document, so it's not a matter of public record. Okay. And maybe the question is, how do they know? So that's more of communication with, um, and what I encourage my clients to do is whomever's nominated as a successor trustee should be notified so they're aware that the estate plan has been created and then where the copy of the plan and who the attorney is that drafted the plan so they know who to contact. Okay, thank you, Mike. We have one final question for you, Dr. Farman. If someone was diagnosed with early stage Lewy bodies today at age 86, can you widely determine their life expectancy? What would a PET scan show in Lewy bodies? Um, I hope you can hear me because the video has stopped. So can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So. Um, it's difficult to, to, to give life expectancy for somebody uh, with any of these neurodegenerative ones. Um, Lewy body is probably even a little bit trickier because you have the ups and downs. And not to be, not to be crude, but at age 86, you've already lived longer than the average life expectancy in the United States, which makes it even trickier to determine how much longer you would live. Um, the PET scans that I talked about would probably not be particularly helpful in Lewy body disease. There are PET scans that show dopamine in the brain. They're not FDA approved, but uh, there is a SPECT scan, which is similar, which is, but, but again, 
these scan are usually more helpful if there's a question and diagnosis. But if you know that somebody has Lewy body disease, I'm not sure that the PET scan would help you in any way other than perhaps in a research setting. Okay. Well, before you go, um, I wanted to thank our presenters today and all of our guests and also let you know that this has been recorded and this webinar will be uploaded to our speakers.roseman.edu site. And we look forward to seeing you April 15th to talk about sexual health through the years. So thank you, everyone. Good night and please stay well. Thank you all. Good night. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. <laughs>